Hi there, I'm Robin Shukra, and welcome to the Cotswold Explorer's Halloween special. Stories of ghostly apparitions, cheeky poltergeists, and blood-curdling noises. When you've seen the film, by following the link in the description of this video, you can buy the guide on our website and visit the ghost-ridden places yourself. The Cotswolds is a region steeped in natural beauty, and we associate it with relaxation, wonderful architecture and views, and lotely hidden gems. The Cotswold Explorer loves spending the long summer days, bringing you interesting insights into the region. But tonight, alas not. In this special episode, we demonstrate how all lights can cast a shadow. Tonight, we are taking a look at the darker side of the Cotswolds, and we're going to show you a trail of the haunted places the region has to offer. So follow me. If you dare. On the western edge of the Cotswolds, on the outskirts of Cheltenham, we find the village of Prestbury. In the Middle Ages, this village had its own market and fair, but these medieval traditions have been somewhat overshadowed by the growth of Cheltenham, and it's now more or less a suburb of the broader city. The village centre, with its old church, has, however, managed to preserve its identity. But we begin our journey here tonight because it's renowned as the most haunted village in all of England. The village is said to be haunted by more than two dozen ghostly apparitions. We start our investigation outside the church. There's evidence to suggest there was a church here before the times of the Doomsday Book, and it is here that the most widely spotted phantom can be found. He's known as the Black Abbot, and is regularly seen in the precincts of the church and the graveyard. He can sometimes be spotted in the High Street too, most commonly on the three festival days of Christmas, Easter, and All Saints Day. Now the Cotswolds was far from spared the ravages of war. Both medieval conflicts and the English Civil War affected many settlements in the Cotswolds, and Presbury is no exception. It is said that several ghostly horsemen have been seen galloping the lanes of this ancient place. One, a medieval rider who was evidently heading to Edward the Fourth camp at Tewkesbury during the War of the Roses, was supposedly shot with a bow and arrow. During 20th century roadworks, a skeleton was discovered with an arrow lodged in its ribs. Could this be the mortal remains of the medieval spectre seen galloping through the village by night? Another horseman appears as a cavalier speeding through Presbury, apparently during the Civil War. Presbury's sympathies lay almost entirely with the parliamentarians, and they set up a number of primitive roadblocks to fortify the village against the king's army. These were rudimentary but effective, simple lengths of rope tied across the roads. This cavalier rode right into one stretched across Mill Lane, flinging him from his horse. Some men from the village lying in wait were quick to grab the unfortunate man and executed him on the spot. It's here that his spirit roams, riding his horse at full pelt moments before he fell from his steed. There are many other spirits to tell of in Presbury, spectral shepherds and strangled brides, so if you're hoping to experience a ghostly encounter, do come and find out more for yourselves. There are many grand houses and fortified structures around the Cotswolds, one of which is Sewdley Castle. Just outside Winchcombe, and built on the site of an earlier castle, Sewdley has a colourful and chequered history. 
It's been restored numerous times, and we will no doubt visit here another time to tell you the full history of the place. But for now, however, it's another spectacular hotspot of ghostly activity. One of the familiar phantoms seen around the grounds is that of Catherine Parr, the only wife of Henry VIII to survive him. Sudley Castle was her home. After she died, she married Thomas Seymour, who was the younger sibling of Henry's previous wife, Jane Seymour. Catherine died after giving birth to her daughter Mary and was interred in a vault here at Sudley. Legend has it that during the 18th century, the castle, being in a state of considerable dilapidation, John Lucas, who farmed the land around, happened across the coffin of the late Queen. Opening it, he found her body to be in a remarkably well-preserved condition. But having exposed it to the elements, however, the body soon crumbled to dust. Lucas was thoroughly reprimanded for the incident, but this did not stop him from interfering with it a second time. With the encouragement of his drinking friends, and well under the influence of the booze, they went and prized open the casket to inspect the contents. This was quickly to have fatal consequences, however, for soon afterwards Lucas went mad and died a sudden and unexpected death. His drinking friends also met premature and violent ends. Since this incident, the Queen has been seen wandering the grounds of Sudley. She is described as tall, graceful, and wearing a green Tudor gown. A whiff of apple-scented perfume can be detected as she passes, occasionally accompanied by the sobs of a crying child. One notable encounter with her was in 1860. An estate worker called Fred Simmons was asked to fix a broken blind by the then Chatelaine of the Castle, Emma Dent. Having repaired the blind by candlelight one night, he was returning via the Chandos room when his candle was suddenly extinguished. This was shortly followed by a woman rushing past who we assumed at the time to be Mrs. Dent. However, upon speaking to the castle housekeeper, one Mrs. Baylis, he discovered that no other person had been upstairs at the time. Fred confessed that sometime before the incident he had taken a tooth from Catherine Parr's coffin. To quote his notebook, could it be so that the ghost of Catherine was permitted to roam over those old precincts making night hideous, and to fill with awe those who had been guilty of robbing the dead. Unsurprisingly, he was urged by his wife to return the tooth to the coffin. There are many other ghost stories from Sudley, including the appearance of two King Charles Spaniels and a large black Labrador. Employees and visitors have apparently seen a young girl in her twenties, a Victorian guest of the castle, roaming around the tithe barn. It's suggested that she had a holiday romance at the castle, and the barn is where she met her lover. Perhaps a more cheery note to finish on. Just outside Winchcombe, we find Hales Abbey. We visited here in episode three of Exploring the Cotswolds, Built in the 1240s by Richard, Duke of Cornwall, younger brother of Henry III, there have been sightings of phantom monks wandering amongst these ruins, and if you listen carefully, you may hear the sound of their chanting, particularly after dark. Continuing up the western escarpment, we're heading for the village of Broadway, and the unusual folly the Broadway Tower. The tower itself is not home to any ghoulish tales, but there is one story from the village. During the Reformation, destruction of churches took place across the country on a huge scale. 
a set of ancient bells from the church in Broadway was said to have been hidden at Middle Hill a couple of miles away in order to save them from destruction. These bells were apparently never recovered. Despite this, the ringing of distant church bells can sometimes be heard in the village emanating from the nearby slopes of Middle Hill. They were reportedly at their loudest during the Second World War, when bell ringing was strictly prohibited. Another story tells of a local villager, Ephraim Rolf. He was described as a gentle soul with a limited intellect, very much at one with children and animals. He earned a small living as a bird scarer in the local fields. One night, he met a violent end. As dusk settled on the field in which he was working, the local squire, mistaking him for a poacher, shot him dead. On dark and stormy nights, it is said that Ephraim can be seen wandering the fields. And, to quote J. A. Brooks, Ghosts and Witches of the Cotswolds can sometimes be seen standing like a skeletal scarecrow. Chilling stuff. Climbing the steep escarpment, we drop off the main road towards Chipping Camden. Here is another classical Cotswold village, bustling with tourism at the height of summer. We visited Chipping Camden before and seen the huge cathedral-like St. James's Church, which is home to our next ghost story. This church is supposedly home to a cursed coffin. It's that of Juliana Gainsborough and is interred in the family vault. Anyone who touched it was said to drop dead within a week. During the 19th century, an agent visited the vault during an architectural inspection. A grave digger warned the agent of the dangers of touching the coffin, but he chose to ignore the superstition. Sure enough, he fell ill the very next day and died the day after that. It's difficult to say why the coffin would be cursed, but one theory is that Lady Juliana became deranged after watching her home, Camden House, burned to the ground. It had been built in 1612 by Sir Baptist Hicks. During the Civil War, Chipping Camden was a royalist town, but it was at an important strategic position, and control of the place alternated between parliamentarian and royalist forces. In January 1645, Camden House was occupied by the royalist commander, Colonel Henry Bard who went to great lengths to fortify the house. When he was redeployed in May of that year to join the King's forces at Evesham, he burnt Camden House to the ground in order to avoid it falling into the parliamentarian hands. Juliana clearly had a terrible time watching her home destroyed before her eyes, so perhaps her spirit did not rest peacefully after her death. Her ghost has been seen many times wandering between the church and what's left of Camden House. Just down the road towards the town, there have been some bizarre sightings of a dancing bear who was supposedly shot by its short-tempered owner. It has apparently only been spotted on a few occasions and always after closing time. Whether you're looking for a good ghost story or a wonderful place to visit, Chipping Camden has it all. Morton in Marsh is another lovely Cotswold town built on the Foss Way, a Roman road that crosses the Cotswold. In common with all the other places we've visited tonight, it has a number of spooky stories. The Manor House Hotel, formerly Creswick House, is said to be haunted by a Dame Creswick who died there in the early 18th century. There is some speculation that she was murdered, but her spirit apparently bears no ill will or malevolence. It seems she's a benign presence. 
but has a habit of tidying things away into inconvenient hiding places. There is also a mischievous poltergeist at the Black Bear Inn. He's known as Fred. Sometimes he makes a nuisance of himself by pushing glasses off shelves and switching out the lights. And every now and then, the sound of an organ emanates from the corner of the bar, which presumably can also be attributed to Fred. A phantom cavalier has also been witnessed at the White Hart Royal Hotel. The hauntings here more commonly take the form of strange noises, distant footsteps in the night, doors opening and closing of their own accord, and eerie laughter emanating from empty rooms. Meanwhile, if you like a hug, the Bell Inn is the place to go. A friendly ghost here is said to hug the guests. Though nothing has ever been seen, visitors have said that the sensation of being clasped in someone's arms is unmistakable. Now, zigzagging across the region slightly, we move east to the famous Rollwright Stones. We've told the story before of the witch that turned a king and his army to stone, but we just couldn't resist including more detail into tonight's ghost stories. It seems that as early as Tudor times, the Rollwright Stones served as a meeting place for witches, but we think they were used much earlier than this, with some speculating that the stones exude some kind of ancient power of pagan origin. One tale tells of the murder in 1875 of one Mrs. Tennant from Long Compton, the village just below the stones, who, having been accused of being a witch, was subsequently murdered. The murderer was James Haywood, who, believing he had been bewitched by Mrs. Tennant, took her life. It seems that Mrs. Tennant kept toads in her garden, and Haywood saw this as evidence of her witchcraft. He was arrested and imprisoned for life in Warwick Jail, where, believing himself still to be under the influence of Mrs. Tennant, he died slowly, refusing all food and water. Many say he may have been deeply influenced by a traditional local saying. There are enough witches in Long Compton to draw a wagon load of hay up Long Compton Hill. Another strange tale of these ancient stones involves any attempt to move or cause damage to them. A man from Banbury was said to have chipped off a piece of one of the stones and with the shard in hand, he attempted to leave in his horse and cart. The wheels were locked solid, preventing him from moving. Another time, a soldier is said to have chipped a piece from one of the stones. He took it to India, and shortly after his arrival, died of typhus. It shows the strength of the tendency of the locals to blame everything on witchcraft, that a man killed of a disease halfway round the planet was thought to have brought it on himself on the hill above Long Compton. In another eerie incident, a local farmer from Little Rollwright wanted to build a bridge over one of his streams. He inspected the stones, and it seemed to him that a capstone from the Whispering Knights would serve his needs. It took twenty horses to haul the stone downhill, and two men were apparently killed in the process. Nevertheless, the farmer persevered, and the capstone was placed across the stream, forming the clapper bridge he so desired. But trouble ensued. Late that night, strange unearthly sounds emanated from the stone, and in the morning he found the stone not laid over the stream as intended, but up on the bank. This was persuasion enough for him to return the stone to its rightful place. It took only one horse to haul the stone back up the hill, a sure sign that this was where it belonged. The Rollride Stones are a haunting place to visit. It is said one can never accurately count the number of stones that make up the king's men, 
but I would certainly invite you to try. Now we move back westward towards the central Cotswolds, arriving at the high point of Stow on the Wold, where the wind blows cold. There was a brutal battle here during the Civil War. So dreadful was the carnage that ducks were said to be swimming in the blood of those that fell. The ghosts we are looking for, however, are from a more peaceful time. The King's Arms Hotel is over 500 years old and hosted Charles I on the 8th of May 1645. The hotel's ghost is not the monarch, but of a little old lady dressed in black silk and white lace. It looks as though she dates from the Victorian era and has been known to sit down next to unsuspecting guests to enjoy a more modern invention, the television. She also seems to enjoy playing with other electrical equipment, including turning the lights on and off. Two phantom children have been seen, also apparently dating from the times of Queen Victoria. They have been blamed for some of the knocks and taps on the doors of guests' rooms in the early hours. And a man wearing high boots, waistcoat and bandolier has also been seen on the staircase. We continue our journey south now, turning off towards Burford, the gateway to the Cotswolds. Many of you who've watched our channel before will know that Burford is a town very familiar to us. The magnificent Church of St John the Baptist, one of the largest in the region, is beautiful by day and night and an essential visit for the Cotswold traveller. It is said that at night time, in the depths of the winter, the bells ring of their own accord. Apparently they are heard by many in the town and seem to emanate from the church, but whenever the bells are inspected, they're always unattended. It seems nothing can be done to quiet them, and the phantom bells are still heard by many locals. Perhaps there's a scientific explanation, or perhaps it's linked to a story we've told you previously at this church. During the Civil War, the church was used as a prison for over 300 mutinous roundhead soldiers. By the orders of Oliver Cromwell, three of them were shot in the churchyard in front of their fellow soldiers to serve as an example. They were known as the Levellers. The bells are not the only haunting known in Burford. The ghost of a man with a rifle has been sighted, sometimes stopping to take aim as if to fire, much to the alarm of the witnesses, who presume themselves to be his intended target. A ghostly monk is also said to wander the churchyard, as well as the neighbouring rectory. In the 17th century, Lord and Lady Tanfield came to Burford. They lived in Burford Priory, a beautiful medieval building that had been converted from a priory into a private home. Lawrence Tanfield rose so high in society that in 1603 he entertained King James I at the Priory. Lawrence and his wife were disliked by many in the town. If he was a difficult person to like, his wife Elizabeth was harsher by far. She considered the townsfolk entirely inferior. At one point, she is quoted as saying, I'd like to grind the people of Burford to powder under my chariot wheels. There are also tales of Lord Tanfield cheating his neighbours, all in all, the pair were universally loathed. In 1625, after a long life of squeezing the townspeople dry, Sir Lawrence died and Elizabeth followed shortly afterwards. The locals breathed a great sigh of relief, but Tanfield free life was short-lived. Such strong characters are seldom expected to rest quietly. After their deaths, the spirits of Lord and Lady Tanfield returned to terrify their neighbours. 
On the darkest of nights, it is said they would ride their fiery chariot over the rooftops of the town with loud cackling and terrifying shrieks. For years, the people lived in fear as the haunting continued. By the 18th century, the locals were so fed up with this phantom chariot, they decided something had to be done. Seven clergymen were summoned to lay the malevolent spirits to rest. After a long chase, the clergyman finally drove the pair to the churchyard. Unfortunately, this was where they were at their strongest. At the east end of the church, in the chapel of St. Catherine, looms their huge, colourful tomb with their hard-faced effigies upon it. The clergyman didn't want this to be their last resting place, and they managed to force them into a bottle. Clutching this bottle with all the strength and willpower they could summon, they dashed down to the bridge over the river Windrush and hurled the bottle into the depths of the river. There it stayed, the spirits finally at rest. The town of Burford could sleep soundly at last. It is said that should the River Windrush ever run dry under the first arch of the bridge, the Tanfields will rise again to torment the town. For many years, the town remained in peace until, in one particularly dry spell at the turn of the 20th century, it became so unusually hot that the river ran down to a trickle and the puddles beneath the bridge where the bottle had sunk began to hiss and bubble. It was as if the Tanfields were making their way back from hell. The townsfolk acted promptly. So desperately were they to keep evil spirits from rising again, they formed a bucket chain from upriver to make sure the spot didn't dry up completely. And to this day, the Tanfields have never risen again. Who knows? Maybe one day, another heat wave will bring the Tanfields back to life. Moving east off the edge of the Cotswolds, just before the bustling market town of Whitney, we round off our whistle-stop ghost tour in the ruins of Minster Lovell Hall. These oddly beautiful ruins stand beside the wonderfully clear river Windrush and next to the nearby church of St Kenelm. Both are well worth a visit. Within these ruins, strange groans have been heard echoing eerily around the place. This would have been a very grand house. It was built in 1430 by the Lovell family. Lord Lovell was a figure of mystery, enjoying prosperity as King Richard III's confidant. However, in 1485, after Richard was defeated by Henry Tudor at the Battle of Bosworth, Lovell became a wanted man. Subsequently, he seems to have disappeared completely from the history books. Perhaps there's a sinister connection in the wailing heard for centuries around Mr. Lovell. When the Wars of the Roses were over, Lovell fled back to the Minster and hid in a secret vault. He gave his servant the only key, charging him to look after his well-being and safety. Unfortunately, the servant died shortly afterwards, and no one was left to tend to Lord Lovell, with, apparently, the inevitable result. It is said that a few hundred years later, in 1708, a skeleton was discovered in the ruins of the house, surrounded by mouldy books and the skeleton of a small dog. Could this be the mortal remains of the ghoul who wails in the small hours of the morning? I suppose it's possible. But there is another earlier tale from Minster Lovell. A woman dressed in white has been spotted wandering around, climbing a long since vanished staircase in the main hall. The story goes that the lady in white suffered the same horrible fate as Lord Lovell himself. Many years ago, it was customary for a bride to be kidnapped by the groom's friends and taken to the church, 
the girl was expected to appear to try and evade her kidnappers in a game of hide-and-seek. She would eventually be found by the young men, and after much merriment the game would be up. On this occasion, however, the fun and games turned into tragedy. The bride-to-be hid inside an oak chest in the attic, the lid of which clicked shut, tragically sealing her doom. No one heard her calls for help, and the hiding place would become her premature coffin. It was many years before she was discovered, a skeleton in a tattered wedding dress. Some say that it is her groom, William, who wanders the precincts of the Minster Lovell Hall, searching for his bride, wailing sadly into the night sky. There are many other scary tales from all over the Cotswolds. Some we've mentioned in previous years, others we have yet to uncover. We may well do so in time for next Halloween. At the very northern tip of the Cotswolds at Edge Hill, where the first pitch battle of the English Civil War took place, there are tales of phantom armies on the move, fighting one another in the sky. It was so widely reported by locals at the time that the king actually sent a commission to investigate, and the records of their conclusions survive to this day. In a previous episode, we spoke about Chavenage House near Tetbury in the southern Cotswold, where the headless ghost of King Charles I arrived to carry off the dead Colonel Nathaniel Stevens, who had opposed him during the Civil War. As the horse and carriage left the grounds, it reportedly burst into flames. Cheltenham, Sarancester and even stately homes such as Snows Hill Manor and Barclay Castle all carry further ghostly tales. All stories for another time. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more ghost stories, don't forget our audiobooks are available over on our website. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and follow us on all the social media platforms. Good night and Happy Halloween.